Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray, and today we are painting Van Gogh's Starry Night. We have Keenan here working the camera. Hello, thank you for coming. Keenan, welcome back. Thank you so much. We appreciate that you're here. I missed the studio. We missed you. It's very cold, but I'm okay with it. We might pay you now. <laughs> <laughs> You've been saying that for years. But actually, we actually need a heater for this studio instead, so sorry, we're gonna buy that. I'm 98 degrees all the time, <laughs> so like a little walking heater. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do this project in five steps. So our very first step is we are going to do the underpainting. Our second step, we are going to be putting in our medium value brushstrokes. Our third step, we will be putting in our dark value brushstrokes. Our fourth step is we will be doing another layer of dark value brush strokes, and our very last step is just some details. We will be using four colors for this project. So our very first color is, gotta check it, tiger orange, which I'm basically utilizing as my yellow because it's actually this really, really warm yellow because sometimes yellows um, can go, depending on their saturation, can go towards like neon or can go towards green. And I love a yellow that leans towards orange and tiger orange does that for me and I love it. It's a great color. It's a great color. Keenan's favorite color is sunset orange. It's Tiger orange is very close to it. Very close, huh? Second color is magenta. Third color is deep blue. And our very last color is black. Now I'm using Let's Make Art watercolor paper. It's a cold pressed paper that is not 100% cotton. Um, I think it works well with the liquid watercolors, but you do want to tape it down because it does warp when it gets wet. And I use the Holbein Soft Tape. That's my favorite artist tape, no matter what paper I use. And uh, make sure you paint on the more textured side. That is the paintable side. I am using three paint brushes. I'm doing around two, around six, and around 12. We're painting some large areas, so we're really gonna be utilizing our round 12 in that first step, and then we'll move to the six and the two as we uh, paint more. <laughs> I wanted to say that better, but I couldn't think of anything better, <laughs> so paint more came to mind. It would've worked really well, but you had a really hard pause. <laughs> I did, I really did. Okay, so we're gonna do our outline and then we'll do our oath, and then we will get to painting. Now, just as a heads up, um, this is a famous painting that is not done in watercolor. So we are going to do a lot of layers to kind of try and mimic the texture and the movement that's in the um, original painting. So just giving you a heads up, this will probably take a little bit of some time, and that's okay. Okay, so when you take your outline here, tape it, and then put your graphite paper in, dark shiny side down. And then whatever mark you make, it will show up on your paper. So I'm just using a pencil to outline it, lifting up, and there it is. Oh. Um, now graphite paper is reusable and it actually gets better with age because the first time you use it, like the, the carbon or the graphite on it is really strong. So your lines are super, super dark but the more you use it, the more you rub off all of that excess, so then your lines get lighter and lighter as you go. Now there are a couple tricks to combat that darkness. Somebody mentioned putting an excess, not an excess, but an extra printer paper underneath if it's too dark because then the lines will still show up, but not like so much. Oh, it would be underneath this one, sorry. Mm, that's a good idea. So it absorbs more. Um, like it takes that pressure so then your line okay. isn't as hard. That makes sense. Or you can use a marker with a softer tip or you can like sometimes what I'll do is if I have to use a fresh piece of graphite paper I just take it, unfold it and take an extra piece of paper and just rub it really really hard to try and mm. rub off all the extra or crinkle it up. A That's graphite, how you, A graphite paper is just excited. You know, when it's brand new, it's like, yeah. let me show you what I can do. <laughs> I'm super strong. <laughs> Look how dark those lines are. I'm doing my job so good. <laughs> or you can use a light box. Some people hmm. prefer light boxes and that's okay. Honestly, honestly, I am not one of those people. I really don't like light boxes. So I use my graphite paper. I'm just always staring at you. <laughs> like, Leave me alone, Lightbox. <laughs> I'm like, Lightbox, calm down. A lot of other people want you. Uh -huh. You're still valuable. To somebody. 
to somebody, not me. Just kidding. Okay, so as you can see here in the outline, I'm basically marking general areas. There's different sections within this painting. And also I want to call attention to, this is not an exact replication of the painting. If you look at the original, there's an entire city scene down here with like houses and stuff. What? That I did not include. I'm just really focusing on the sky and the hills. I had no idea. Really? I don't think I look at the original ever. This is the original painting. So you can see down here that there's houses, there's a steeple with a church. Wow. Yeah. It, it keeps going for a long time. Um, I edited that out, honestly, because I was worried about how long this project was going to be mm. and how you would approach that. It would just, you know. And really, I feel like the sky is the best part. It is. Now the thing with outlines is they're just guides. So if you forget a line or if you miss a spot or if you're just like, I don't really know what's going on there. Don't stress, it's not a big deal. Just eyeball it. Oh, miss this circle. Okay, so how we're going to approach this painting and essentially the rule for approaching watercolor paintings in general is you start with your highlight, so your lightest value, and then you build up from there. So you paint your lightest and then you do layers and layers going darker and darker and darker. In other traditional mediums, acrylic or oil, I stopped talking because of the mic. Nice. <laughs> In other traditional mediums, you actually do the opposite. You start dark and then you build up your highlights on top of it. But because watercolor is transparent and you see through it, if you do a dark value and then try and put a highlight on top of it, you're not going to see that highlight. So essentially what you have to do is you have to think inversely. So you put your highlights down and you leave those highlights alone and you don't paint on top of those as you're painting. So essentially, what we're going to do with this underpainting is we're going to look at the lightest colors and values in these different sections. And that is what we will paint our underpainting with is those light values. And then we'll do brush strokes on top of that of the medium and dark values. Cool. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And if you were to create your own painting off of a photograph or whatever it is that you want to recreate, that's how I would approach it. You identify the lightest values in the different sections. You paint those first and then you leave those sections alone that need to stay highlighted and you build on top from there adding darker and darker values. It is a little bit tricky to learn but what isn't tricky to learn? Baking. I think yeah. you I think you need to follow a recipe. <laughs> I don't know sometimes it's not that simple I, I say that I ruined a chocolate cake a few months ago. <laughs> that frosting that you made? <laughs> yes the frosting. Okay. Sorry. Sorry sorry about that. So let's get started. So I'm going to use my round 12 because I'm going to paint large and larger areas. You can still use your round six for this. It's just will take you a little bit longer. Okay, so this top section here, I'm going to take my blue and just add water. So I'm pulling some color out into the middle of my butcher tray. Sarah, would you be willing to pull your reference photo down a little bit closer yes. to your brushes? Thank you for looking at that for me. Thank that you. Better? Yeah, okay. much better. So I'm just, I pulled <clears throat> some blue into the middle of my palette. I'm grabbing water with my brush, mixing that into the blue. And now I have this really light value blue. And that's just what I'm going to paint here. Well, I will nice. be avoiding the circles because the circles are going to be yellow. Hmm. We don't want those to be green. Exactly. And this can be rough. It doesn't have to be um, perfect, perfect wash, because we're going to be doing so many layers on top of it. We just don't want it too dark. You also might get some weird bleeds, some weird hard edges. Um, that really is okay because we will be covering up the majority of what it is that we're laying down right now. So 
So, Keenan, are you at all familiar with Starry Night or Van Gogh? Ooh, uh, like I mentioned before, I did not know there was a city landscape in the painting. Mm. So, so that would be a no. No. <laughs> do you have information? Yes, I do. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I have so many interesting facts. I want to like say them in a way that's cohesive and makes sense. Now, so, I have seen a Doctor Who episode with Van Gogh brought to the future to see his work. Really? It was touching. Aw. It was very great. Yes, because the interesting thing about that is Van Gogh essentially, I think he only sold like two paintings in his, when he was alive. Wow. And the funny thing is he didn't consider Starry Nights to be one of his good paintings. What? He like listed what paintings he thought was good and Starry Night was not one of them. Oh. And it's now worth like a hundred million dollars. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of, um, when I read that, I just kind of laughed a little bit because, okay, sorry, I'm gonna do this second chunk. And this one is a little bit, we're gonna add a tiny, tiny bit of yellow to it to warm it up just a little bit, but not a lot. We don't want it green. We just want it kind of like a warm blue. Hmm. And I'm gonna be painting this chunk. Okay. So uh, now, now I lost my train of thought. You were saying how he didn't think Starry Night was his uh, it very wasn't, good. Yeah, it wasn't one that he considered good. And I think that that's kind of interesting because there was a time, and there still is a time, where um, I paint for myself. And I don't know if I like everything that I paint. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I love my style. And especially when I first started, I didn't like what I made. Um, and it's just kind of funny how we're sometimes so critical of what it is that we make or what we're looking for is not necessarily what someone else is looking for. And so we like think like, oh no, that's not good or whatever reason. And then other people can say like, no, this really is, this means something to me or I see something in this. And so I just, I think that we're not always the best judge for our own work because we're so close to it. I like that. And I agree, because if Van Gogh didn't think one of his paintings was very good, and now we're still talking about it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It's one of the most recognizable paintings in the world. Yeah. Like, it's just. Now, the funny thing about this painting, okay, this bottom section, we're going back to just the straight blue light volume. Um, I saw this painting in person. Wow. When I went to New York, and the funny thing is I actually almost missed it. So I believe it's at, um, the MoMA, Museum of Modern History. And I loved that museum. Oh my gosh, I absolutely loved it. But all like the super, super famous paintings are on the fifth floor and I didn't know there was a fifth floor. And so like my husband and I, we were in the gift shop and I just saw so many Starry Night things. And I was just like, wait a second, <laughs> is this here? I like went to a guard, I'm like, is Starry Night here? And she's just like, yeah. <laughs> It's like fifth floor and I'm like what and Michael and I ran up to it I don't know I don't know how we I mean there, there was literally a crowd like I don't I, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure obviously you're looking at the paintings not I was the crowd. so enthralled with the paintings that like I did not see what that crowd was doing yeah it's a it's a little bit smaller than I anticipated but I got some good close-up shots on my phone it's just um there's so much texture to it. Wow. It's really beautiful. And there were a lot of other really great paintings on that floor. I'm glad I didn't miss it. <laughs> that was <an> awkward. <laughs> Going all the way to New York to this like museum once in a lifetime trip and I almost missed Starry Night. Yeah. Okay, so we got the first half. We're gonna go down into our like mountains and our ground now. Um, so this one here, this section here, it actually has a yellow glow to it at the very top. And so we need to put that yellow in now. So I'm gonna do a yellow. And of course, when you go from like yellow to blue, there will be a little bit of green. There's gonna be a little bit of green, but it's okay. So we're gonna do yellow. Still using my 12. And then I'm gonna blend that out and grab blue 
because the rest of it is blue and it has like a highlight of yellow at the top. I got a little bit of bleeding. You see how that bled? Mm -hmm. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my six and pick that up. And we'll be doing a lot of layers. Oh man, I was not careful. Look at all this bleeding. We're gonna do a lot of layers on top of this, so I'm really not that, that worried about it. So just pick up what you can. Okay, that's fine. Blue. Okay. Again, this is not perfect or smooth. <laughs> It's a little bit wild right now. That's okay. This is just our underpainting. We're basically just establishing the colors and the values right now. So then the next one is going to be blue. And these darker, like these mountains down here, we can add a little bit more value on them because they're darker compared to the sky. They don't have as, as many highlights in the, in the original painting as the sky does. Mm. So we can, we can add a little bit more paint to our brush. Just gonna try and be careful with my bleeds. I'm painting a little loose, a little loosey-goosey here. Okay. I'm gonna clean up that edge. more blue. And actually the area we just painted, I'm gonna mix a little bit of black into my blue to almost get like a navy a little bit. Hmm. Put that in there. Again, we're still not going super dark in value. This is probably the darkest value that we've put on our painting so far, but it's not like so dark. Okay, and then the next section is gonna be just blue. My blue is starting to bleed to my black a little bit, but that's okay. So the interesting thing when I was reading about Van Gogh and um, his life and the different styles is I always considered him um, painting in the impressionism style um, but he wasn't he was actually post impressionism so impressionism is basically like when we do Monet when we paint Monet Monet is like the father of impressionism so we'll go over in detail all those different um, markers for that style um, because I guess I always associated a impressionism with like thick brush stroke um, kind of like color and movement in the painting um, but post impressionism is a little bit different than impressionism so impressionism is really focused on capturing light but natural light so they really focus on plain air painting which is when you go outside into the world to paint and they would paint quickly short brush strokes and layer the colors next to each other to capture the changing light as it happens outside as realistically and quickly as they could wow where post impressionism it's focused a little bit more on the artist's emotions and the symbolism involved in painting as well as using bolder and brighter colors because even though these are thick brush strokes with color this sky the swirly sky actually really moves away from what you would see in nature and so impress impressionisms even though they were capturing light and trying to capture um, the movement they were still trying to do it in a natural way that when you stood back far away from the painting and be like oh yeah sunset that looks awesome great job done you know what i mean hmm. where like with post impressionism they really focused on um 
evoking an emotional response and unnaturally vibrant colors and more variation in their brush stroke. So they like took impressionism and like turned it up. Cool. Does that mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. So um, <laughs> it was funny because I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I've been like thinking Van Gogh was one thing <laughs> this whole time and he was actually not that, but it's trick, always good trick, to learn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's what I get for making assumptions. Okay. So I'm going to mix a little bit of my blue with my yellow with my black to get kind of like this turquoisey color here. And that's going to be the bottom of these bushes. Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. Now this cypress tree, that's actually what this is. This is a cypress tree. And we are going to paint that brown like a light like a really good brown, and then we'll do black layers on top of that. So to mix brown, I'm going to grab yellow. I thought that was a crusty mountain. A crusty mountain? Yeah, I had no <laughs> idea that was a tree. It is a tree. It's a cypress tree. Wow. And I'm going to add a little bit of black to that to turn that orange dark, because brown is essentially dark orange. Oh. And now I have this really gorgeous brown. I'm just going to paint that. This brown color. And maybe we'll go a little bit darker. So this cypress tree, mm -hmm. um, okay, let me give you some more information. Yes, please. Um, because I was doing this like art history box, I really wanted to make sure I knew what I was talking about in these tutorials. <laughs> so I went to the library and I checked out all these different books on the artists and like all of that stuff. And in this book, it talks about this painting and the symbolism of this painting. And usually Cypress in art um, is like a symbolism for like cemeteries and graveyards and death. Oh. Yeah. And so like this painting um, in general is kind of like this idea of heaven and earth and how they're like linked between death kind of thing, this whole that's cool. Yeah. That it was, was just, planned? I mean, this scene, okay, now I'm going, now I'm going to all that I know about this painting, Keenan. I wanted to save some for like the rest oh, of the tutorial. Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I'm just teasing. You ever had a milk chocolate orange? <laughs> 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 Redirect. <laughs> Don't get me talking about snacks. You know, we'll talk about that forever. I'll forget this painting. I'll leave right now and buy a chocolate orange. Yes. Who cares about painting when we're talking about chocolate? That was a good redirect. Thanks. <laughs> the cypress tree made me think of it. <laughs> okay. Rinse. Because now we're going to do our yellow, light value, yellow sections. We're almost done with our underpainting. You guys. You're doing great. Take your time with this. Boop, boop, boop. This looks super cool. And now on some of these dots, these circles, I'm gonna leave the center white. For added suspense. Yeah. No, just for added highlight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive you guys crazy and just leave <laughs> random white sections. Joke's on you. The brown's going to take over the yellow. It's an underdog story. <laughs> you were prepared for that. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to, like, see if there's any... Okay, that feels pretty good. And don't worry if you're looking at this and you're just like, this looks like some weird sci-fi painting. What is happening? It does, it will get better. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to do a million tiny brush strokes. <laughs> because when, um, when originally I had this idea to go over like famous 
painters and artists, I was talking to my husband and I was just like, I really would love to do Starry Night, but like I do watercolor and this is clearly like an impasto painting where the painting is thick. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And he was just like, just layer those brush strokes, just layer those values, you could do it. And I was just like, challenge accept accepted. I'm gonna try it. Damn. And it worked. Like I feel like we get that feeling of that movement, but it just takes some time. Huh. Okay. okay. So, I'm going to grab some blue. Try and get a clean blue. I have a lot of different mixtures going on here. You can add a little bit of water to it. And I'm gonna use my six. And basically, when you're, when you're painting these brush strokes, one thing I really want you to pay attention to is the direction and the movement of those brush strokes because I feel like that is hugely important to the overall effect of this piece. So when you're looking at this, I want you to see the angle. And you can see here, it's so, like these are curved. This is curved. This kind of goes down and across and then back up almost around the stars. And so when you're putting these brush strokes in, just take a look at that, the overall direction. So I'm just gonna start, and you can start anywhere. We're just gonna do this. Oh, wow. Yep. Oh, I was thinking you were gonna make smaller brush strokes. I'm gonna do them, like the first time that I try it, I did really small brush strokes, um, but that took so long. And then also I looked at the painting and the painting, they're not necessarily short. Like there's a, there's a variation in oh. the stroke and some of them are longer. And so for a while I was really meticulous, almost like pointillism. Do you know what pointillism is? That's essentially like dots for a painting. I think Seurat is known for his pointillism. But anyways, that's like, <laughs> so that's what I was trying to do at first. Um, but I don't think we have to do that. I think that because this is post-impressionism, we have a little bit of freedom with our brush stroke here. Mm. Did you see my sweater got in my yellow? I did, just a little bit. <sighs> this is why I can't have nice things, you know? Paint all over my clothes. That's what sweater sleeves are for. <laughs> to get into paint. Yes. So just like go. Once you figure out the overall direction. Now, at, when we get here, it gets a little bit tricky because it's, it goes up and down. So make sure you leave spe space in between. You see that I'm leaving some space in between those chunks. That's because we still want some of those highlights to be seen. If I were to do this over and over so close to each other, we would lose that highlight underneath. We don't want to lose that. So you got to be aware of your spacing. This looks so cool. It's going to be so fun, especially when we do like that very last, like our second layer of dark value. That's when it's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you will make that noise. Oh, Your yeah. voice will go deeper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and here it kind of starts like this is really taking over the movement. So now when we get to about here, my, my brush strokes are now starting to contour around this. And it's okay, I'm getting some rough brush strokes and I'm okay with that because texture. And then as I get closer to this sun, moon, some people will say it's Venus. Huh. I'm gonna go lighter in value. Some people say Venus? I think so. Let me see in my book. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe I just made that up. Cool. 
<laughs> they said, oh, okay. They said the orange could be um, his desire to mix the moon with the sun. And that's why this is the color it is, but ah. interesting. Man, I wonder where that Venus thing came from. Okay. Van Gogh was a funny dude. Yeah, yeah, and he had a lot. He actually painted this while he was at an asylum. Oh, wow. And um, it's interesting because if you look at his work, I mean, he has so much work, like so much work. And first of all, can we just say like, if there's anyone who painted for the passion of painting, it is Van Gogh. He did not get any recognition. He did not find any success. He did not have validation. He still created though. And he has this huge body of work that's just these beautiful, amazing paintings because he wanted to paint. And I think that that is a wonderful way that we can approach this. I think sometimes we get discouraged if we don't get that um, external validation that comes with being talented at something. Um, but the truth is we might not always get that. That might not always be available to us, but are you in love with painting? Are you in love with the way that creating makes you feel? Do you enjoy the process more than the outcome? Because if so, then you should keep painting because that's what it is about. It's about what it does for you. It's not about getting someone to think that you're talented, even though that feels really good. I'm not gonna lie, that feels great when somebody validates your work, validates your time and your efforts, but that can't be the only reason why. You gotta love it. And that's how you get, that's how you keep going when you make a mistake or you go through the hard slumps or you feel like you're not improving. Do you love the process? Because then just keep making. And then over time you become like really talented because you kept going, you kept practicing and showing up and that's what it takes to like improve a skill. <sighs> Sorry. That was great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go actually to the underneath section because it's the same color blue. So I'm kind of keeping it in that sections here. And it's, when I first did this project, I was very meticulous about my brush strokes, like very, very meticulous. Um, and then, when I was looking at the original, I realized that they kind of blend way more than what's happening. So um, what I did is I just took a like damp brush and kind of blended some areas and smoothed some of those brush strokes out because I feel like um, in some of these areas, like right here, I feel like it smooths a little in value. So I was trying to identify the different mm. values and trying to even the ones that felt too, um, too different in value. So that's why when I'm painting this right now, I'm being a little bit looser with my brush strokes, um, a little bit more okay if they're not all the same because like some of those areas were just gonna kind of blend out anyway. Okay, so now we're gonna go into our swirling area. And I'm gonna grab a little bit, I'm gonna use that same blue and then grab a tiny, tiny bit of this green that I have mixtured here. Now this is a desaturated green. This is not like emerald green here. And that's perfect, that's what we want. So it definitely, definitely leans more like desaturated turquoise. And just start putting in your brush strokes. Remember to leave space for your highlights. Because again, with watercolor, we can't put those back in. Try and also, when you're doing your brush strokes, try and alternate them so it's not like boop, 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 boop. You see the difference between mm -hmm. this and this? And our brains are gonna wanna do this because our brains love patterns and we make them when we don't realize it. So just try and think of like alternating, like bricks. 
And then this kind of swirls into this, goes in and out. I also love this painting because I, I think that there's so much power in brushstroke, even in watercolor. The direction at which you are painting something matters and informs viewer, the viewer of something. And so I love that there are these swirls in the sky that you see and they're mostly defined by just the brushstroke. And I find that fascinating. It's the same colors, but the movement really takes you in, takes your eye all the way across and under and back. And it's just a, a wonderful tool to utilize for composition. And I think this is an excellent example of that. How just the angle at which your brush strokes at your painting really inform the viewer's eye of where to go. Now the interesting thing about this too is this scene he imagined. So he was at an asylum when he painted this, but he had a lot of freedom. He was able to leave with like a guard and he can go paint. He had his own painting studio. Um, and the theory, so like they looked at where that asylum was located and they couldn't find a scene that matched this. So they think he combined various scenes throughout his life, specifically maybe the Netherlands where he was from, and um, maybe the rolling hills of kind of the countryside or the different, uh, or like different sketchbooks. Like they were kind of like combing through, but essentially he took this scene and created it. That's it's crazy. not crazy. Yeah, it's not there, <laughs> which is so cool. That's amazing. And so I get the question a lot. Hold on before I get into that. We're going to move on to the bottom part of our um, first layer of values. So again, we're going to be doing lighter values. I'm going to add, so I'm going to leave the yellow part alone and just do that like blue green value underneath. And remember, these are our medium values. So if you're just like, but it's so much darker here. It is. We haven't gotten there yet. We'll get there. And we'll just put these brush strokes in, but leave the yellow part because we're going to do like yellow on top of those soon. Man, I was saying something. It's going to be good. Um, oh, you get the you get the question a lot is what you said. Oh, Kanan, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so because um, I like to do landscapes in my own work and right now, that's kind of something that I'm really in love with. And I get the questions a lot. Are you using a reference photo? Are you using a reference photo? And the thing with painting anything is that if you paint something enough, you can start combining reference photos in your mind. So if you're really interested in painting your own style and you're just like, I really want to go off on my own and not rely on reference photos so much. There's a couple different ways that you can do it. I'm gonna leave the bottom section for now. And I'm gonna do the yellow swirls. So I'm gonna use just straight yellow and go in the swirls. So, not painting from a reference photo. Start with reference photos. Start with them, because they're a great tool. And then, maybe take a reference photo and say, okay, I'm gonna change an element of this. I'm gonna switch out the sky. The sky in this reference photo is just blue, but I want mine to be sunset. So change out and change into a sunset. And then think about, okay, if, if the sunset were to change, would the light change on this tree? Would there be a yellow glow on this tree because the light is different? So then you're challenging your mind to imagine these scenes, but the wonderful thing is reference photos are outside our door. So when you're driving, well, maybe when you're a passenger and not when you're driving, notice, notice what is around you because so much of, of art is looking and observing. How, how does the cloud look next to the sun when it's setting? Is it dark? Is it light? Is it pink? And there's gonna be a million different answers because it changes every single night. 
but start collecting those moments in your mind. You can even take notes if you want. I don't, <laughs> I'm not a great note taker, but like the other night I was driving home and the moon was so bright and full, like so bright and full. And we were passing these fields and the moon was casting this gorgeous glow on the fields that we were passing. And there were sometimes ponds and you can see the glare, it was so mm -hmm. bright. And I was just like, oh, and I just watched it. And so when you're starting to go off on your own, start with a reference photo, switch one thing out. And then your next painting, switch two things out. I'm gonna add a tree here, or I'm gonna take away a tree here. And just keep on doing that, keep on doing that. Try different scenes, try different skies, try different overall shapes and compositions. So then when you do go to a painting, you can just like pull one together. Okay, I want this overall feel, so I'm gonna do this guy with this tree line with this pond. And you know what, it might not be a photorealistic rendering, but like, does it have to be? And I know that it's scary when you're making those decisions because you're like, well, I don't know how light hits off this tree unless I see it. That's totally valid. That's totally valid. So like, you can look if you need help, just go and take a gander be like, okay, I really just need an example of like a, a tree next to a sunset and go and observe that. But it doesn't have to be the whole thing. It can just be pieces and parts to where you feel comfortable enough to say, I'm just gonna go for it and I'm gonna guess and maybe it exists somewhere, but even if it doesn't, that's okay. All right. So that feels pretty good. I'm gonna do a little yellow here. Not a lot, because there's actually not a ton of brush strokes over here. Now, and if you would prefer to look at the original photo or the, uh, the original painting instead of my rendering of it, that's fine too. Sometimes you can get more information from looking at the original, original reference than somebody else's interpretation. And this is easily accessible. So pull up a picture on your phone and go for it. Just drive to New York. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna actually do one um, layer in my cypress tree and then we'll move on to our second our third step. Sorry, I had to check my steps. So I'm gonna add a little bit more black into my orange mixture, and a little bit more yellow and magenta. So I have a nice dark brown. You can just start with same brush strokes. Leave spaces for the light. Gotta let the light in somehow. And if I remember correctly, yeah, you can kind of, I'm gonna angle this on the close up so they can see. Can you get a good look of that? They're kind of longer, I would say. It might need to be pulled away from the camera a little farther. There we go. There you go. So this is actually mostly dark, very, very dark. So we'll be doing quite a few layers on top of that. I just kind of wanted to show you the overall brush strokes how little light is actually peeking through on this cypress tree. It also is amazing how helpful it is to look at the nature around you to use as reference. And I really think that I wouldn't have fallen in love with landscapes the way that I have if I never moved to Missouri. Cause the land here is powerful and big. Like the natural aspect of this state um, is so much bigger than what I experienced in California. And it just like, and even though there's not mountains, <laughs> it's pretty flat. It's so much sky. 
and it's so green and it's so alive. Not right now because it's winter. It's sleeping right now. Very sleepy. <laughs> Even then though, that snow is powerful. That wind is powerful. That ice is strong. Like I think it just call it forced me to look at the world around me in a way that I never looked at it before as this entire force that you like have to pay attention to. You're in awe of it. Like Missouri weather is no joke. You cannot ice storm, you are staying home. Like it demands your attention and your respect, which is actually really beautiful. And it was something that I, I like, God, snow days didn't exist in California. <laughs> we never got days off of school because of weather. Like that never happened. But here it's a thing because like, you can't override it. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't. I think we had 20 last year. Yeah. And you just respect it and you accept it and you move on. And it's just like, I think that demand for attention, like, made me look look at the sky and the fields and the ground and the colors and the vegetation and it just was like whoa this is powerful do that there's that examples of that wherever you live wherever you are there's respect for it so just like go for a walk see what you see see what you what calls your attention or demands your attention as i would say in missouri okay so we're moving on to step three, our dark values. This is where we can get a little bit stronger with our colors. So I'm gonna grab more of that blue. And actually that blue turned, that blue mixed in with my black and I'm not ready for that yet. So I'm just gonna give more blue right there. Okay, we're doing blue. So you just wanna make sure that this, whatever you're laying down, is a darker value than what you have previous. We want these to stand out. Switch up your brush strokes, pay attention to that overall movement. Oh, I missed a little guy right here, a little yellow. That's hmm. okay. That's okay, that's my painting, that's not a big deal. Must have forgot to put him in. So at this point, it really starts to break away this goes up, this one kind of goes more down. And I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you, I feel like this, this kind of style of painting is just so different than what we've encountered before because, you know, before or the projects that I try and teach, I really try and embrace watercolor for the medium that it is, which, and that looks like embracing the bleeds, embracing wet on wet, embracing this accidental element. And so this one is definitely way more controlled than the projects that we usually do with watercolor. And it's good to do something different because there's probably some of you that are like, oh, <laughs> I just want to drop paint in water and watch it move. And then there's also probably some That's of you me. that are, yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably some of you that are just like, finally, structure. I understand, <laughs> you know, and it's good to experience both. It just helps you understand what you're interested in and it challenges you. It's always a good idea to push yourself to try something new. Even if it's not your favorite thing in the world, you can still learn from it. You can still apply these lessons into whatever it is that you do want to make.
I actually, um, when we were in New York, we went to the Museum of Modern Art and um, the Met. And mm -hmm. in the Met, there was this entire section of Van Gogh paintings. And the florals were so unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I think I looked at those longer than I looked at Starry Night. Well, there wasn't quite, there wasn't a crowd like there was. Um, but there, I think there was like four floral paintings next to each other from Van Gogh. And I just couldn't believe the color. I couldn't believe the texture and the colors that I used next to each other. They were so beautiful, so beautiful. It just like, it was actually really difficult choosing which projects to pick for this box because I was thinking like, I could do an entire series on Van Gogh alone. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful work. Um, but I love that with this one because Nicole did a famous artist box and she did this with pastels. And I just love the idea of being able to approach the same project with a little friend and <laughs> using different mediums. So I really wanted to do something that can pair it. So if you're interested in doing this maybe with um, a child or a grandchild or you know niece, nephew, whatever, um, and you don't think they can sit through the detail of this, we have, an, we have a kid's one just for you that's ready to go. And you guys can do the same thing, which I think is really fun. That's a fun one. It is, and oil pastels are just so fun in general. So I'm going into that swirl. Okay. So at this point, we're really starting to feel the movement. We're starting to get an idea of all the, the different values going on in our brush strokes. And it's just gonna get like more and more and more. So again, if you're looking at your painting like, this still doesn't look like the reference photo. Either of them. Well, <laughs> we're not done. Okay. And then when we get to this section down here with the highlighted yellow, I noticed on the original, if you can kind of see here, so I feel like there's a lot of variation to length and brush stroke in the sky, but on these hills, those brush strokes are long. They're just continuous. And so we will be doing long brush strokes on mm. those hill, like this. And I'm not going all the way to the top because I want there to be um, yellow at the top. So I'm kind of avoiding the top. And that again, looks cool. Yeah? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Your brush stroke can give a hint of movement. Yep. That's wild. And this one kind of actually rounds. And then the one underneath it is definitely more of a navy. And this one, it actually has like a hard edge at the top. So I'm gonna kind of outline it. I mix black and blue together to get kind of this navy. And then I'm just gonna follow the contour of this hill. Maybe this a little too. And then these here, these are like bushes. So they kind of like start to curl. Now again, how detailed you want to be on this is up to you. I mean, with watercolor and just how we're going about this, you there's a lot of opportunity to do layer upon layer. I'm trying to keep this simple so we don't feel overwhelmed, but if you're looking at this thinking, you know what, I actually want to do this in two or three layers, or like six layers instead of two or three, do it. Like this is your painting. You can also try and do it like just all at once. Like let's just see how that turns out. You know what I mean? Like. What if you did a fully watercolor version of Starry Night? 
where there are these color changes, but maybe it's not necessarily about brush stroke. I don't know how that would turn out. That sounds interesting though. Sounds way cool. Like you can use that salt technique for the stars that That's we did. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Like put a bunch of salt in one spot and yeah. see what happens. Let's just see what happens. So I, I don't want you guys to look at this as this has to be this perfect final piece that looks exactly like the original painting, exactly like my version. This is a true, true learning opportunity for you to explore. So take the liberty to do something different than how I'm doing it and know that you are empowered and you have the right to do that. And it's not wrong. When you said the original, it made me think of the office quote that Michael Scott quotes from Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah, you it? miss 100%. You miss all the shots you don't you take. You miss all the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> Michael Scott. Yeah. I'm thinking Starry Night, Van Gogh. Same thing. <laughs> My version of Starry Night. No. No, I wouldn't. I couldn't, couldn't even be close to claiming what this is. It's just Hopefully. so much. Okay. So now we're gonna do our swirls. So I'm definitely grabbing a darker medium, going with those blues. And let's go. And how you can tell when it starts to feel like we're not quite there yet, but things feel sometimes unfinished. If there's a lot of white space. Now the interesting thing about how we're layering this here is your values adjust according to the values that are around it. So we put barely their colors in when we first started, right? But as we start to add more and more darker values, some of those barely their colors are actually gonna read as like white. And so if you're looking at this, like there's still so much white, Actually, it's just that our barely their colors are reading as white, which is like interesting in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But if you're experiencing that in your painting, be aware of that and just know that you can just do some more layers. However, I caution you because the, I think the other hardest thing that people struggle with is their paintings being flat. And flat paintings happen when you don't have a range in value, when all of your values tend to kind of meet in the middle and are even across the board. And so if you're looking for depth in your painting and if it just feels like it's not popping like it should, then you need to broaden your range of values and make sure you have your highlights, your medium values and your dark values. And like a gradient can be like 20 steps in between. So just kind of pay attention to your values as you're painting. Got more blue. Man, it is really cold back here. Yes, it is. <gasps> we only have one space heater. Oh, and it's not even on. <laughs> okay. All right, we're gonna go into our second layer of dark values. Okay, so this is really where we're gonna like, I think we should start seeing things tighten up. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'm gonna grab blue and I'm gonna mix it with a little, little bit of black, not a lot. I just wanna make sure that it's a darker value and pick up more paint than I did last time because that is also how we get a different, a darker value in watercolor. And again, just go. Don't think about it too much. Don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about exact replicate, replicating what it is that you see. 
Think about the movement. Think about the colors. Think about how this makes you feel. It's interesting because when you look at Van Gogh's work, the colors that I use actually really reflected his emotional state. And so, um, you know, sometimes he works in these vibrant yellows, just bright, just happy. And in this painting, you can tell that he was kind of struggling with his depression because it went back to that dark, mm. the blues and the grays, like the, the ground here. Hmm. I just think that there's so much power in communicating emotions. But it doesn't have to be so obvious. It doesn't have to be like a painting of a sad man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can paint melancholy just in the colors and the brush strokes. You can paint through so many different things that you're feeling just by what you're drawn to at that time. And the wonderful thing is you don't even have to explain it if you don't want to. It's your painting. Nobody even has to know it. I mean, we've already talked about um, Georgia O'Keeffe. And so many people put their own narratives on her work. And that wasn't her intention at all. <laughs> all of these people were assuming what it was that she was trying to say. And she was just like, no, I, I actually just wanted to paint a flower close up. That was it. That's all I really wanted. But we can't control that aspect of it. And we don't even have to defend ourselves if we don't want to. When you paint something, you put it out into the world. People have a right to view it how they view it. And we got to let that go. But that shouldn't stop us from creating. And if there's one thing I learned, people are going to think whatever it is that they want about you no matter what. And a lot of that just has to do with the relationship that they have with themselves. You know, if people aren't nice to you, especially on the internet, like the internet, I think is a wonderful uh, display of this, where there's, there can be such goodness and kindness, and there can also be meanness, but most of the time that meanness has nothing to do with you. Doesn't this start to feel a little bit better? I was just going to say, it's crazy how you've already done this, like another layer of dark and how much darker just the top layer is than the swirl. Yeah. And, and if you want, you can go through and blend it a little. Don't go too crazy, but like, if you want to smooth out some of those values just a little bit, don't get rid of them. We still want them to be there. But maybe soften them is a better word. Hmm. Sorry, I'm just like so into this right now. <laughs> no, you're great. Okay. I'm gonna let that go and dry before I do anything to it. And we're gonna move on to this bottom section down here. So again, we're kind of, I'm being a little bit more thoughtful about my brush stroke because this is like the tightening. We're starting to kind of tighten our painting in. I feel like for me, the first half of painting is essentially like 
just getting paint on the paper. And then the second half is kind of reacting to that first half and just like tightening things up, you know, kind of finessing, darkening values, that kind of thing. I love the bottom of that page so much. This part? Yes. I love the difference between the two. And actually, when I was painting this for the first time, I really, I double checked like three times because I'm like, these brush strokes are so different than these ones. Like, what? It, but I'm like, no, that's how, that's right. You know, like, um, and I love that. I love them next to each other. And I love how that it, it informs us of the feel of it. You know what I mean? The flow. The flow, the movement. And also, I just feel like there's so much in this sky. Like, there's so much going on. You can feel that depth. And then, like, with the landscape, it's just, like, land that goes along. You know? Hmm. Okay. Now we're getting to the middle here. So the interesting thing about these swirls in the middle, if you look at the reference photo and at both reference photos, is there are bits of yellow in this where the stars are kind of like, do you see that? How there's like yellow, yellow, mm -hmm. yellow, yellow. And yeah. in the night sky, it's mostly around those stars. So as we're putting in our blue, I'm also gonna be paying attention to the yellow areas as well and like kind of reacting to those also. And then when you go, and we'll do a yellow really quick. When you put in the yellow, this is where I'm gonna give you a little bit of creative license because like you're gonna wanna put it in the areas where there's not a lot of blue, so then that yellow can really shine through. So even if like on the reference photo, let's just say maybe the yellow is here, there's a lot of blue right up here, so I'm gonna move the yellow to here. because I, I really want that to peek through and I don't want it to be too green. And if your yellow is reading too green, if you mix like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of magenta in there with it, it's gonna give it that super orange warm feel more than that color naturally is. <laughs> We're gonna need some hot chocolate after this. Ooh, that sounds good. It does, doesn't it? Okay, blue. I haven't had a lot of hot chocolate this wintry season. Me neither. That's unacceptable. <laughs> I'm not okay with that. <laughs> The tricky thing that I, when I painted this swirl, was actually trying to like not leave white chunks outlining my cypress tree. <laughs> Ooh, that would be tricky. Because you want your brush strokes to stop and not go into it, but then that makes it feel like it's outlined, which it's not. So then you just, just be mindful of that. Make your brush strokes go all the way mm -hmm. through. I feel like I really needed to define this swirl against the other one, so I'm doing, I mean, a pretty liberal with my brush strokes here. That looks so cool. I feel like with this mixture, I'm definitely leaning more towards the like, um, towards the green blue. So I'm just being aware of that. I'm gonna grab just deep blue and bring that into here too. And I actually really love this like deep 
tur turquoisey blue. But I want to introduce that like vibrant, that vibrant straight out of the tube, deep blue color. I want to make sure that's represented. So I'm just doing a couple layers of that. And I'm kind of trying to avoid my yellow area so I'm not getting too much overlap. And then when we go down here, this kind of like curves. It's almost a black color. And then these like bushes and fields, the line work isn't like straight. It kind of just curves like this. So it's almost like little hooks. Oh. Now I'm mixing, now I'm mixing all sorts of colors here. And then these kind of like curl in. Boop, 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 boop. Boop, boop. Gosh, this is just such a great exercise in <laughs> breaststroke movement. Ology. <laughs> okay, let's attend to our cypress tree, and then I'm going to do the yellows, and then we're going to move on to step five, which is like our details, kind of really tightening, finishing things up. So I'm going to make I'm going to mix some more black into my brown that's still on my palette. Do some more brush strokes. The cypress tree almost looks like it's on fire. Yeah, it does. Because of the yellow, I think, the small highlights. Yeah. I mean, it's reading very, very brown right now. And yeah. in the original, it's much darker. So we got a few layers to go. Very cool. That feels better already. All right, so I'm gonna switch to my two actually because I'm gonna work on my um, like stars. So I wanna make sure I have a clean yellow. And I'm gonna do my two and kind of do smaller. So as they get closer to the center, and you can do a little dot in that center for the star, the brush strokes are small. And then as they go out, they get bigger. And you can have them kind of run into the blue a little bit. It kind of reminds me of a, of a rose a little bit, but the strokes don't need to be alternating like a rose would. These ones can just kind of surround it. So almost like a star. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and really play with mixing magenta in this yellow see because like I feel like there are some areas especially when we get into the moon where you're like that is orange that's just an orange color um, so like allow yourself to kind of play with those different, that range of hue, hue is color, that range of color with the yellows, a barely there yellow, and then like a solid warm yellow, and then like an orange yellow is a good range. It looks so cool. It's just so fun.
Don't forget the little dots in the middle. Okay. And then when I do my moon here, I'm gonna mix yellow with a little bit of magenta to get kind of that corner orange color or edge, I guess. And then rinse your brush and grab just yellow, like a healthy amount of yellow. And paint in that moon. But we definitely want it to stand out from the yellow that's around it. We want it to pop off from that. So if you need to go a little bit darker with your moon so it does pop, you can. So I'm gonna add a little bit more orange to my yellow or magenta to make it orange. So then it's like very clearly, this is the moon. Okay. Then we can do more kind of brush strokes around it. But there's a good amount of light value between the moon and this. Well, let me check. Okay, so this one, it actually leans really green on hmm. this. Can you see that? Yeah. Where that? So, like, let's go for it. I'm going to let this yellow kind of bleed into the blue. Ooh, that's pretty. That is pretty. Kind of work that area where they meet a little bit. Oh, that's nice. I really like that. feels pretty good. I think this little chunk got a little bit too dark that it's distracting from the moon, so I'm just going to blend it out. And I'm still using my two. Okay. We're going to move down here. Do this little guy. Don't forget these little ones. They still deserve their little brush strokes. Their moment Shine. Their moment to shine. Shine bright like a brush stroke. <laughs> and then I need to do the kind of like highlight on this um, mountain range. You see how yellow it is, how highlighted that is right there? Oh, yeah. So I just want to make sure that it actually like stands out from the color that's underneath it. And if you want to mix a little bit of green into there where these blue and yellow spots meet, you can. All right, and the very, very, like we're, we're coming in the home stretch here, you guys. This is where we're really um, finishing things up. So I am going to, there are some areas where there is a very dark value, like almost black in between. Not all over. We're not doing it all over. It's just some. So I'm going to put that in. So I'm going to mix. I'm, I'm going to use my two, and I'm going to mix this very dark blue and kind of in some of these up here. It's just sections. We're not doing the whole thing down here. Right here. 
Is that considered a highlight or is it a shadow? Shadow. Highlight is light, shadow is dark. That's what I thought, but it's so dark and contrasty, it shows up really well, so yeah. it confused me. Yeah. Yeah, light is a light is a really interesting thing. And sometimes if you just flip it, it can they can do the opposite thing from each other. Like you were saying, the dark is so strong against it that it acts as a highlight. Yeah. And what it does is it brings your attention to it and does that contrast between values, which is the same thing as what a highlight does. You know what I mean? Right. So it just kind of it's like two different sides of the same coin. Shadow highlight. I feel like just putting in the super dark value just gives us a little bit more range and depth and value. And it doesn't, again, it's not all over, but I feel like it just deepens those moments where it's going away from us. I love that. Yeah. It adds a depth to it. I've loved the various stages of this painting. I know. Because it's, it's just slowly coming more and more to life. Yeah. And we're really almost done. I know we've been here a long time. But I hope, I hope this has been fun and worth it. So I'm just doing a little bit of shadow on this swirl here, not a ton, because I want to keep it overall fairly light. And then underneath here, there's some. Okay. And then I'm gonna take that same black mixture and kind of do another layer over here because these were really dark. Go ahead and look at your like fields and say, do these need a lot of attention? I don't feel like they need as much attention as the sky. But this is your painting, so you're like, oh, I can do one more layer. Okay. Cool. Okay. And then our very, very last thing, I'm going to grab my six. I'm going to get it black. I'm going to kind of dry it out, which means I'm going to like hit it off my butcher tray or my paper towel to where it's a dry brush. And I'm going to do dry brush texture on my cypress tree. Cool. Because this guy is dark. And we want it to be mostly dark, but we want to be able to see into those hints of color a little bit. So I felt like the dry brush texture actually really lent itself this section because you'll get that uneven rough brush stroke and this is where you can kind of like sharpen your points a little bit of that cypress tree even if it's not totally accurate to the painting. You can take those liberties, you guys. Okay. I think we're done. Wow. That was fun, wasn't it? That's an amazing painting. Ah! I love how it turned out. I love it. I love it. Let's take off the tape. So I'm just going to softly. So I did something a little bit smart this time. I did a double tape. Oh. So then I can get the satisfying clean edge, but it's still taped onto my surface. So it will dry flat. You see what I'm saying? No, not at all. It's confusing. <laughs> you double taped? Yeah. So this is still taped. Oh. You see what I'm saying? <gasps> oh. I did two layers. So you can leave it. Yes. Oh, wow. Because 
let me, I'm going to be real with you guys. You cannot avoid paper warping and watercolor. You just can't. It's just what it is. You're painting on paper. Yeah. But there, there is ways. <laughs> You're literally putting water on paper. <laughs> yes. Um, and of course, paper quality and stuff affects it. But I have noticed the best thing to do is do not untape your paper for at least 24 to 48 hours. And I have gotten, um, that's how I get the flattest paper. And I've even like ironed my paintings to flatten them. Um, but what works best is just keeping it taped to its surface for like two days. Dang. So this way, we can do our satisfying clean edge reveal. So satisfying. And it can still be taped. There we go. Now when you pull your tape away, you want to do it away from the painting slowly. What? <sighs> yes. Okay. This well, was so much fun. What phrase did you say you were going to say when you were done? What was yeah. it? I just said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. That sounds right, though. <laughs> okay, I hope you guys had a great time painting this. Thank you so much for sticking it through. I hope you learned stuff. I hope you take what you learned here and apply it into your own painting. You guys are artists. You can do this. It's just a skill that's learned over time with patience and kindness and practice. I just realized we didn't do our oath. Did we? No. That's okay, you guys know it. All right, so if you're on Facebook, you can go to our Facebook group. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. Join it, it's a part of a very large community, but it's a great place for inspiration and support. Um, if you're on Instagram, you can tag us at Let's Go Make Art. Um, hashtag Let's Make Art. I really appreciate you guys for painting with me. I had the best time. Keenan, thank you for being here. Thank you. And I'll see you guys next time, bye.